Hey, Cade. 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 What? Where Where have you been? Basketball practice. Again? Yeah. How in the world are we ever going to win any games if we can't even make a layup? Oh, my goodness. Can you? <laughs> Basketball season. Will it ever end? We can't hit a shot. Yeah. <laughs> Just come over, over here. Let, let's calm down. Welcome to Across the Hall, a podcast sharing ELA strategies from one doorway with your host, Cade Summers and Michelle Shelton. This is episode nine, Wrestling Writing. And we are back. Back with attitude. Back with attitude. We are back with praises and hallelujah that basketball season is over. Oh yeah, basketball's over and... It was a fun time of year. Uh, I love basketball. It's my favorite sport. I'm a native Hoosier, and that's just what Hoosiers do. But um, this time of year is a good time of year because, well, uh, one season's coming to an end, and spring is coming. So I'm just so happy to be back in the podcast room, ready to go talk a little bit about some writing and grammar today. What about you? Yeah, me too. Uh, I'm actually really glad to have had the interview opportunity we have with Connie Hale, and I look forward to the audience getting to hear a little bit of that. Uh, I definitely found a lot of value in getting to have this conversation with her, and I think everybody else will too. Right. Um, Connie is the author of Sin and Syntax and another book called Vex, Hex, Smash, and Smooch. Good job um, slowing that down because that's, that's a, a mouthful. It is a tongue twister, actually. Um, Go but, faster. I can't. I can't. Vex, Hex, Smash, Smooch. Oh, my goodness, I did it. Look at that. I'm so proud of myself. Um, so we wanted to do an episode on grammar, and as we talked to, um, as we kind of talked it out, we decided to talk about grammar and our writing and how to use grammar to better our writing and to help kids really find their voice in their writing, which is something really hard to teach. Um, so we have this interview with Connie, who knows all kinds of things about grammar and writing um, as a writer herself. This really got started with Shelton having an idea. I just called her Shelton. That's our non-across-the-hall speak. Hey, Shelton. Yeah, that is what he calls me. Anyway, so, Michelle, it's anyway. awkward. It's been a little while. It's been a while. You know, some of the best of the best out there still get breaks when they need them. Right. The Google Teacher Tribe, they take they took a break in the summer. And so it's it's been fun just to kind of um, appreciate what we're doing. Yeah, but it's also great. Um, to get back to what to we're To get doing. back to it and to talk about how to make our classrooms better. Um, so writing and grammar... Um, I say the word grammar, super grammar nerd. I know I've got a lot, lot of grammar nerds hearing my voice right now and that we are excited to talk about how to incorporate grammar a little bit better into our classrooms. Um, grammar sometimes kind of gets pushed to the side with all the writing and reading requirements that we have. And um, this is a way to kind of use grammar um, in a more fun way and in a way to make our writing better and to un- help us even to understand what we're reading better. So it all goes together and it's um, something that we need to make sure we focus on. All right, so in this episode, obviously, we're going to talk to Connie Hale, uh, but we'll try to create a little spin on some of the things that uh, Michelle and I are already doing in our classroom. We will um, also discuss some things maybe that we'd like to do, and especially uh, coming off of that discussion with Connie, she mentions a few things that we definitely want to uh, remind you of toward the end of the episode. Uh, as to some things that you can actually practice in your classroom. And um, do you think that this is limited just to ELA? I know we have an ELA audience, Michelle, but to what extent you know, might our other listeners continue to listen? Oh, right. Um, I have a, a colleague who really is right across the hall from me since my room has been moved, and she's a first-year teacher. She teaches history, and she is always looking for ways to get her students to write and understand what they're reading better, and I think that she would really appreciate this episode as well. All that and more coming in this episode nine of Across the Hall. Wrestling writing. Let's get started. Uh, my name is Connie Hale. My I go by the writing name of Constance Hale, but I'm really a Connie. Um, I'm prime, first and foremost a writer. I'm, I was trained as a journalist, but I've written everything from ch- poetry to children's books. Um, my interest started in how in 
this particular way of looking at language started when I was teaching high school in San Francisco. And I thought, how can I teach students how to write better without boring them to tears with grammar the way that it's usually taught? So many years later, after um, going to journalism school and being a journalist and editor, I worked at Wired Magazine, which had a very irreverent attitude towards um, style. And we ended up writing a book called Wired Style about the way that technology was changing the way we write and think. And that book um, was a lot of fun to write. And it inspired me to then put some of my, more my thoughts down on writing and the relationship between good grammar and great writing. And a lot of the ideas that I had developed teaching high school informed that book. So that was Sin and Syntax. And after many years of Sin and Syntax being out in the market, um, I was asked if I wanted to write another book on language. And I thought, what more do I have to say after writing those two books? And I thought the one thing that I felt that I had a lot more to say on was verbs, that I have come to believe that if you only do one thing to change your writing, that thing should be to focus on the verbs and to write, and that will help you write more dramatic sentences. So that was my third, that ended up being a third book called Vex, Hex, Smash, Smooch. <laughs> I like that name. <laughs> so what is your experience with the idea of intentionally teaching some of the, the ways to manipulate grammar and mechanics? Well, I guess I have to say, you know, I I kind of, speak out of both sides of my mouth, because if you think about it, and I like to use the example of art and artists, Picasso didn't start breaking the rules when he was a young painter. He as a high school, you know, as a, as a teenager and under the training of his father, learned how to do life drawing, learned all the basics of painting, and was a very good representational painter before he abandoned the rules and invented cubism. And I think the same thing is true in writing. So first of all, I think that in order to break the rules effectively, you kind of have to know what the rules are. And so the first point of sin and syntax and my whole approach to writing is, you know, if you want to be a good writer, you kind of got to work at it. And there are some rules that you really need to know. But I hate the word rules because so often the way that grammar is taught and the way that writing is taught is with these really hard and fast rules rules. Mm. So what I, I prefer to think of them as underlying codes in language. So I'm kind of like, it's not so important to memorize a bunch of rules about grammar, but rather to understand what are nouns anyway? What, what do nouns do? How can we use them better? How can we twist them and bend them and, and play with them? Um, similarly, what are verbs? You know, what's a, what's a good verb? What's a bad verb? What, how can we use verbs uh, to make our writing to bend our writing in the direction that we want to bend it in. And so on the one hand, I'm pro rule, or at least I'm very much in favor of people studying language and understanding language. But the whole point of doing that is so that you understand language so well that you understand what you can bend. So I'm not so much into breaking rules as I am into bending them mm. and bending them knowingly. I, I, I hope that makes sense. Unfortunately, a lot of what people learn about grammar, things like, you know, can't end a sentence with a preposition and all these are do's and don'ts that are very rigid. And I'm trying to approach language in a slightly different way. Like, what is this thing? What can we do with it? How can we play with it? Um, what, where's the elasticity? Um, and so it's, it's almost a frame of mind as much as anything else. I'm not encouraging people to be um, slackers. I actually think we need to work very hard at writing, but there, but we can also play hard at writing. Right. So the, the reason that I even I thought about this idea is because it is so difficult to teach my students voice and how to mm -hmm. use their voice. And so I started thinking about my own writing and what do I do? What is my, what does my voice sound like? And I realized that a lot of times that is, that comes out in a fragment or right. I might have a word that I use and I'll put a period after that word. Um, mm -hmm. And I do some weird things. I, I overuse ellipses sometimes. That's just kind of mm -hmm. style, I guess. 
And so that, that idea of being able to teach them how to break those rules came up, but in thinking about teaching that to them, obviously okay. I have the concern of, um, at what point is it, is it okay to introduce the idea of bending those rules to them? How, mm-hmm. how well versed in the rules do they need to be? Because right now I'm still struggling with students writing fragments and especially run on sentences. Mm-hmm. Um, so how do I get them from where they are to finding that voice and being able to use a fragment, for example, mm-hmm. on purpose rather than just mm-hmm. know that it's a fragment? Right. So I do a lot of so the way that I usually approach it is that I try to give a very simple lesson, you know, a very simple in part something relatively simple about, let me just say, for example, verbs. Let's take verbs for a minute. And what is the most important thing for us as writers? Now, remember, I'm coming at this as a writer. So I'm not an English teacher. I'm not an academic I'm a writer and my job is to write something that people want to read. So when I look at verbs, I think, okay, what do students really need to know about verbs? You know, to be perfectly honest with you, they don't need to know about transitive and intransitive, for example. So a lot of the way we teach grammar, it's like we use words like transitive and intransitive. Nobody can remember what that is, what's the difference. But there is a difference that there is a distinction in verbs that does make a very big difference in sentences. And that's the distinction between what I call static verbs and dynamic verbs. So that's the difference between what what most teachers call active verbs like chew or race or pace or um, punch. Uh, So really dramatic verbs, dynamic verbs on the one hand. Then on the other hand, we have what I call static verbs. So those are your verbs like is and was and were and am and become. There's a whole class of them. And so I think it's worthwhile to know the difference between those two kinds of verbs because they make a lot of a difference in a sentence as they there's different sentence patterns that each one sets up and static verbs make your writing static. You know, if you want to write in a way that's dynamic, which is going to be more interesting for a reader to read, that's a basic distinction that every writer ought to know. And so I try to break it down very easily. I mean, that's, those, that's a pretty easy concept for, for any kid, you know, kids, adults, anyone to grasp. And then a lot of times what I do is I come up with exercises that have them do this, like, okay, write a paragraph, just write a paragraph off the top of your head. How many times do you use is's and was's and were's in your sentence? Truth of the matter is most of us use them all the time. Now rewrite that same paragraph using dynamic verbs. And so sometimes I think you can, you can structure something very simply. And the, the point is, what's the difference in the sentence? Which, is, which paragraph is more fun to read? It's always going to be the one with the dynamic verbs. So that's kind of the way that I do it. So it's not so much, okay, now break the rules as just try it this way. Now try it this way. Which one do you like? Which one do you dislike? And going to your thing about sentence fragments, like really trying to get them to understand what a sentence fragment is, and then write something in all sentence fragments. Write something with no sentence fragments. What's the difference? How does it sound different? So that's kind of how I approach it, like trying to lay down the basics and then encouraging them to experiment in two very different ways. And then asking or having a conversation about what the difference is, what's the impact of a sentence fragment, you know, and which one sounds more conversational, which, which say if you do two, para, two paragraphs, I find if you write all in sentence fragments, it ends up sounding like advertising copy. Um, <laughs> so that's kind of how I like to approach it. When it comes to like the static verbs, dynamic verbs, I had noticed that in um, sentence syntax too, I'd, I'd read a little bit in there. I like what you had with, um, uh, Shakespeare's Hamlet, the to be or not. Mm-hmm. And here's a fun, oh, just, to, just to break in there, something super fun to do is to take Hamlet's speech and to take all the static verbs. Well, the static verbs are tis and is mostly. So have students look at that speech and identify every static verb. Then have students look at the speech and identify every dynamic verb. Great dynamic verbs. Die, sleep, suffer. What are some of the other ones? Dream. And then I get some volunteers and I ask the students, the first set of students, okay, could you please act out this sentence? He is in the room. (laughs) Tis a shame. And just have them act it out. And they can't do anything. They're they're just stand there. And then, okay, now act this out. Die. (laughs) Sleep. Suffer the mortal, you know, or shuffle off this mortal coil, you know. 
And it just, you see right there that the difference between them, breaking the rules, you know, actually, I'm not, a, I'm not encouraging them to break the rules. I'm actually encouraging them to do the right thing, which is use dynamic verbs. But I'm using play to illustrate why that rule exists, you know, or why that guideline exists. Like, here's why it's better to use dynamic verbs, to understand what dynamic verbs are and to write with dynamic verbs, because it creates a picture for someone that a static verb doesn't create. You know, which play do you want to watch? The play that's filled with is's or the play that's filled with dream and die and sleep and suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune? So as far as teaching verbs, if you have some fledgling writers who have not developed a strong vocabulary of Mm -hmm. uh, dynamic verbs, do you have any Mm -hmm. exercises as a writer that you would recommend to broaden the scope of that word choice? Yeah, I think, and I think word choice is so important. And, you know, word choice is really simple, right? It's not that hard. It's not that hard a thing to grasp. And so once you get the difference between static and dynamic verbs, the next step is differentiating between dynamic verbs and real dynamos, you know, really dynamic verbs. And so I do things like, there's a passage in um, Vex, Hex, Smash, Smooch. It's really hysterical. I use it all the time. Mm -hmm. It's called Hoppers, and it's written by Garrison Keillor, the com- the radio personality and comic writer. And he basically goes to a corner of the street near his office building, and he watches a whole bunch of people do exactly the same thing. That is, he watches a whole bunch of people jump over a puddle. And the entire piece is a description of a whole bunch of people doing the same thing, jumping over a puddle. And basically, if everybody's doing the same thing, you have to find a different verb for the way each person does it. They're all hopping over the puddle, but how does this person hop versus the way that person hops and how can we express that through verbs? So I'll find a reading like that where someone is taking advantage of the flexibility of English, taking advantage of the wonderful richness that our language has and just show, and it's very funny, you know, and it's a lot of characters. And then I'll say to the students, then we'll have a contest. I'll say, okay, I'm going to give you, let's try this. I'm going to give you a verb and I'm going to give you two minutes and you write down as many synonyms as you can. And usually I, if it's students in high school, I usually, since I just showed, we just read that example of hoppers, I'll use the example of walk. They walk. I mean, how many of us, we say he walks into a room, we use walk all the time. There's nothing wrong with walk, but like consider the possibilities. So I give them two minutes or it could be five minutes, but two minutes is usually enough. Write down as many synonyms as you can. And I tell them quality matters as much as quantity. And so at the end of the two minutes, they count and I get the top one or two or three people with the most to stand up and we compare, they read them off and we do we sort of go around the circle and, you know, one person reads his verb and if the other people have it, they cross it off their list. The last person standing wins a prize. Okay. So the point being, you have to be creative as well as thinking it's just as important to have great synonyms as it is to have a lot of synonyms because somebody else might have the same synonyms as you do. So that's a fun way to illustrate what a lot of people don't realize, which is the first word that pops into your head is usually not the best verb. Just You just got to do a little bit more work than that. It only takes two minutes to come up with some really good ones. And then um, the next step after that, so the first thing is just develop your own mental thesaurus. So when you're looking at your paper and you see that you wrote walk, you think, wait a second, I can do better than that. And maybe what I tell people is in the margin of your paper, just write down the five verbs that are better. Once you get those five verbs, take the best one and walk yourself over to a thesaurus and look up that verb in the thesaurus. Then you'll probably get 25 more. For a long time, I taught just grammar and writing. Literature was separated into a different class. Mm -hmm. So I taught, I did teach the transitive and the intransitive and the reflexive and the intensive pronouns and Mm -hmm. myself to death, I think, Um, Mm -hmm. that kind of grammar. And, And so eventually I learned that that playing with it is so much more fun. Um, Mm -hmm. When it comes to actual syntax and sentence structure, uh, what are some lessons that you have used to help students play around with that a little bit? Mm -hmm. Well, um, just, I should probably just back up, backtrack um, one little bit because uh, there's one more step to what I was just describing. So step one, difference between static and dynamic verbs. Step two, improve your, you know, read something that, shows dynamic verbs in action. Number three, play a game that 
encourages people to be creative and explore. Number four, do something a little time consuming like look up something in a thesaurus. And number five is then you go watch a bunch of people do exactly the same thing and write about it. I'll have people come in at the beginning of the day and I'll say, okay, write me a quick paragraph. Don't fret too much about it. Just, just write kind of four sentences that come into your head. Um, your first five minutes today, write down your first five minutes. So they write whatever they write. And if I'm, for example, trying to teach about subjects and predicates, then I use that example of their writing, just a spontaneous bit of writing. And I ask them, you know, we go through some of those paragraphs and can they identify the subject in each, in each sentence? Can they identify the predicate? Or sometimes, say we're studying sentence structure, you know, I'll say, okay, what kind of sentence did you write? Did you write a simple sentence or did you write a complex sentence? So a lot of times I'll use a very casual, fun writing exercise and I try to make it fun like something, you know, you're not writing about uh, imagery and allusion in the poetry of T.S. Eliot. You know, you're writing about your first five minutes of the day when the cat jumped on your head and you woke up with a start, you know. So try to make the writing assignments fun. And then we, I use their own writing to talk about the grammar. Does that make sense? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, whenever you are kind of getting the, the students to play around with some of the grammar rules a little bit, are there some um, texts, some authors maybe that you use often that have played around with uh, the rules of grammar and, and structure a little bit? So I use Hemingway a lot mm -hmm. because People think that Hemingway writes really simple sentences, and he does, but his sentences are really clean. And so I like to show with Hemingway, like how um, he can have a really long sentence, but you don't get lost in it because his sentences are very, very clean. So he doesn't use a lot of adjectives, a lot of adverbs. Hmm. So um, as far as people who kind of break the rules in a way that's really fun, I use Muhammad Ali who's a brilliant writer. And what's interesting about Muhammad Ali is that he, okay, first of all, he didn't write. He tended to rap. So we don't think of him as a writer. We think of him more as a speaker. But people who have written biographies of Muhammad Ali have discovered that he spent hours in his hotel room the night before a press conference practicing his lines. So we don't think of him as a writer but he was a writer in his habits. And so he would come out in these press, press conferences and say these amazing things and reporters would write them down. Well, they were, they, were, they were sentences that he had crafted ahead of time. And so I like to use him as an example because people don't think of him as a paragon of good grammar, but actually syntactically his sentences were brilliant. Like every piece was in place and he knew how to break the rules. So, um, the way that he broke the rules was actually with word choice and surprising metaphors, but that's not really breaking the rules. I mean, he was just doing, he was, he was doing things nobody else was doing. Um, but grammatically or syntactically, he was following the rules. So let me give you an example. When he was in 1974, when he was going to do the rumble in the jungle, this is in the book, by the way, in the simple sentences chapter, um, Somebody asked him, are you ready? Are you ready to face George Foreman? He goes, am I ready? He goes, only last night. I murdered a rock, hospitalized a brick. Wait, how did, let me just get this right. I'm probably misquoting it. Only last night, I murdered a rock, hospitalized a brick, something out uh, I'm so bad, I make medicine sick. Super funny. Super like crazy, like who murders a rock? What does that mean? You know, just unexpected. But if you diagram it, it goes subject, verb, direct object, subject, verb, direct object, subject, verb, direct object, subject, linking verb, complement, object, complement. I mean, it's like that, you know, it's so diagrammable. It's perfect. And so I love him as an example, or even like um, float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. You know, he just, he, his sentences, that nobody else would come up with that. And you would think that that's not, quote unquote, good grammar, murdered a rock. That's nonsensical, you know, but so he would, his vocabulary was unusual, but his syntax was perfect. And that's what made it funny. And I, I love using Groucho Marx. So if you take Groucho Marx quips, a lot of the, a lot of the times Groucho Marx played with grammar. So when he said, um, 
Last night I shot an elephant in my pajamas. How he got into my pajamas, I'll never know. <laughs> so he was playing with a dangling part of the, uh, dangling modifier. The joke there was a grammatical joke. Last night I shot an elephant in my pajamas. He understood that what was funny about that was the in my pajamas. So Groucho Marx is a great example. Mark Twain is a wonderful Mark Twain. If you just go through Bartlett's book of quotations and take every Mark Twain sentence, you know, they're funny. And then you can see why they're funny is a lot of times that he's tweaking the grammar in a certain way, or he's exploiting the syntax in a certain way. And then I would say the other thing I love to use is, is advertising copy, because a lot of times ad copywriters understand the language well enough that they break the rules knowingly. I'm saying like got milk, for example, got milk. Uh, why is that funny? Why did, was that such a successful ad? Well, because it was kind of grammatically incorrect. You're supposed to say, do you have milk, madame? <laughs> right. So those are, those are kind of, you know, I like to use those examples to show how when people really kind of understand what's going on, they, they, they understand the rules. And then they tweak, that's when they, they tweak things in such a way. In Muhammad Ali's case, he tweaks it by using unusual vocabulary or unusual metaphors. In um, Groucho Marx's case, he's intentionally playing with dangling modifiers. In ad copywriting, cop, in copywriting, it might be that they're going really conversational instead of being proper. Or it could be the opposite end of the spectrum. Pardon me, do you have any gray poupon? So in that sense, it's being hyper proper, and that's kind of the joke. So I use ad copy a lot, actually, to make grammatical points. And I often encourage kids to, I often encourage students to go find ads that they think are really funny. But the ads have to be funny, not because of the pictures, but because of the words. That is such a good idea. That's, that's a very interesting Then there was a really, there, I mean, I have a lot of these examples in my books, so you've probably seen them, but you know, when you're talking about, um, I don't know, it's hard, it's hard to teach subordinate conjunctions, it's hard to teach relative clauses, you know, that stuff is hard to teach, and uh, so my favorite example there is the 1960s, you're, I'm going to so date myself now, but like in the 1960s, because I remember this ad when I was a kid, Winston tastes good like a cigarette should, okay, so that's a great ad, because it's got rhyme, and it's, you know, da, da, da. and then all kinds of grammar nerds jumped on their case, because that's an incorrect use. You shouldn't say it's not Winston tastes good like a cigarette should. It's Winston tastes good as a cigarette should because you should be using a subordinate conjunction there, not a preposition, right? So first of all, again, you in order to know the humor, you have to sort of understand the grammar, right? So what did they do? What did Winston do? Did it correct its ad? No, it wrote another ad that says, what do you want? Good grammar or good taste? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> So I love ad copywriters because they are examples of people who really know the rules and they're breaking them, knowing that they're breaking them and knowing that it's going to be funny and why it's going to be funny. Right. I, um, I also, as I was teaching a few novels, whenever I was teaching the eighth grade, I, I noticed that the particular novel we were reading at the time, um, the author used a lot of dashes. It just seemed uh -huh. like dashes sprinkled everywhere and that gave me the idea mm -hmm. to do a lesson on punctuation personality and so I you know divided them in groups and gave them different novels and asked them to figure out the author's punctuation personality but in order to do that they had to know what the punctuation rules were so they could tell me mm -hmm. the author was breaking them. That's really creative that's great I love that um you know, it's funny because um, everybody always, I mean, people need punctuation so badly and I haven't, I touch punctuation only a little bit in, indirectly in, in sin and syntax because, because um, you can't really teach punctuation. As you know, you can't really teach punctuation until you've taught the whole sentence, right? People have to understand so much about phrases and clauses and sentences before you can really teach them about punctuation. But um, I love that example of a punctuation personality and um, 
you know, again, Hemingway is great because there's kind of two Hemingways. There's the Hemingway of the short sentences and the Hemingway of the long sentences. And so that's kind of fun to use Hemingway. There's some descriptions of that Hemingway. Uh, there's some place descriptions that Hemingway does that are these really long sentences joined together with and. And um, unlike somebody like Joyce who writes really long sentences and like you get lost in them, in Hemingway you never get lost in them. And then Cormac McCarthy is brilliant. I mean, he's like, like one of my favorite writers to use. Um, um, there's a passage that I use that I use in Sin and Syntax. Um, it's in the um, Subjects and Predicates chapter, and it's a passage from All the Pretty Horses, and that's an example where he uses punctuation and the lack of punctuation to echo what's happening in the action of the paragraph. So he has a paragraph in which he's describing the two protagonists getting on their horses and walking across the field and then trotting across another field and then cantering and then galloping off towards Mexico. And what's really cool is he starts the paragraph with really short sentences, so a lot of periods. And then in the middle of the paragraph, there are longer sentences, fewer periods. And then the last sentence is like this Joycean, very long run-on sentence with no punctuation. And so the punctuation and the length of the sentences echoes the length of the stride of the horses or the you know the pace of the horses that's so cool to me and also that that paragraph is exquisite because he does this thing with subjects and predicates like he repeats this one pair they rode he repeats it over and over again in the paragraph so even when he gets to that really long unruly sentences you don't get lost because he's anchoring you with the subject and predicate so uh, Cormac McCarthy is pretty, pretty, he's such a stylist that you can really, he's doing stuff with punctuation that some, some authors aren't doing. So I like Cormac. And then of course in the road, I don't know, that's probably like way beyond your ninth and 10th graders, but the road, he abandons punctuation and he does that for a stylistic reason. So it's, Cormac McCarthy is pretty interesting on that level, on the punctuation level. Um, I also just wanted to mention to you all and um, hope that you could share this with your listeners and your colleagues that um, my publisher is being very uh, supportive with Sin and Syntax. And um, I am working on some um, lesson plans for teachers. I'm almost finished with them. But I have a whole 120 pages of lesson plans that accompany Sin and Syntax. And some of the lesson plans are available on my website now um, for free. And then what I'm doing is I'm going to be soon, like in a few months, making an ebook that teachers can purchase for a really modest price. And so there are a variety of ways to get the lesson plans. And my publisher is also often willing to send desk copies to teachers who are interested in using sin and syntax in the classroom. So um, I'm I'm trying to making a big push right now to put together some resources for teachers that will help them uh, come up with creative ideas about how to teach grammar and how to teach grammar in the context of, of writing. And even the reason to do the lesson plans is, you know, you're not necessarily going to use sentence, like the kids aren't necessarily going to be reading sentence syntax, but the teacher could read it and then use the lesson plans. And um, the lesson plans are divided up into different skill levels too, so that they're appropriate for different ages. I hope your listeners and your colleagues will find out about those where I'm in the process of putting them together. But some of them, the first eight chapters are already available um, on my website and um, you can download them for free. That's great. That's a, that's a lot of lesson plans. That must have taken you a lot of time. And, and well, it has. <laughs> <laughs> on my website, which is www.sinandsyntax.com, if you look on the homepage of my lesson, pl uh, my website, there's a place that says there's a link for lesson plans for teachers, and then that'll take you to the lesson plans. And right now, the first eight chapters of Sin and Syntax, which is all the parts of speech, I've got the lesson plans that correspond to those chapters up on the website, and you just, teachers can just have them for free. While I'm not a professional educator and I'm not as trained, well trained in pedagogy as the two of you are, I do. Um, really support the work of English teachers, think it's very important, and um, want to do whatever I can to help. So, so we, we appreciate so much you taking the time to talk to us. Um, you gave us our your website, sinandsyntax.com. A lot of our mm -hmm. listeners are on Twitter, so how can they follow you on Twitter? At Sin and Syntax. 
okay, easy enough. Mm -hmm. <laughs> thank mm -hmm. you so much, Connie, for being with us. All right, Michelle. So I really like that interview so much so that I learned something about you. I already knew this, but um, I'm going to use it at least to my advantage throughout the rest of this episode. I'm going to refer to you as Grammar Nerd. Oh, uh, okay. I, I can handle Grammar Nerd. I was starting to get scared as you got into that uh, sentence. I'm just going back and looking at our notes from that interview, and I see, as quoted, I consider myself a bit of a Grammar Nerd, Connie. Um, I believe I am incredibly proud of that title, actually. A grammar nerd I am, and I'm um, super excited to be one, actually, as I'm always super excited to be all kinds of things. Uh, excited. But anyway, so, um, yeah, I am. And I love to correct grammar, which is can, can be a social problem. You're not supposed to correct everybody's grammar, and that's actually something I'm trying to teach my child. Stop correcting everyone's grammar. That people don't like that. I corrected somebody's grammar in the lunch line in the cafeteria the other day. And my student's friend said, you're not even in his class right now. <laughs> so you can lose friends this way. I keep trying to tell my child, but at the same time, um, I can't stop myself from doing it. So, yeah, grammar, grammar nerd, that's exactly what I am. Yes. Yeah, so what, what kind of precipitated this episode? And, you know, you and I had gotten together and started talking about what we might do here. But what got, to get to, got this going? Well, I'll tell you, um, actually, a couple different things. Um, one of those things is that I've been trying to incorporate blogging into my classroom and trying to teach my um, students how to kind of code switch and go from writing this very formal academic paper to writing a blog post that is much more personal and conversational um, and trying to get them to make that switch. But another thing is that in the ninth grade, we are using a rubric that is the QOE GV rubric, and the V part of that is voice. And voice is something that is just very, very difficult to teach. And in the ninth grade especially, it's, um, not very many students have it. So I started looking at my own voice and my writing to see what it is, what is my voice. Whenever I write something, what does that sound like? And people will comment sometimes on my blog post about um, the way that I sound and I'm kind of conversational. And I thought, how do, how do I do that? I'm not even... And I noticed when I went back that I'm using sentence fragments. I use sentence fragments. Um, sometimes I will use one word, and I think I mentioned this in the interview with Connie. I'll, I'll use a word. I know I wrote a post, and I used the word B-U-T by itself because I wanted to really focus in on the fact that even though I'm experiencing this truth, but you know this other thing is, is still true as well. So um, I used the word but, B-U-T, um, by itself. Um, as a sentence, and that is something that would completely fly all over a grammarian if they did not understand that I was using that to prove a point. Yeah, there has been something similar in my classroom recently uh, where my students have demonstrated a, a difficulty with this. Now, looking back, by the way, at, at Connie's interview, and we need to kind of get back to the beginning with her and some first impressions we had that were actually incorrect. Let's come back to that in a second, though. Okay. But in my classroom just recently, uh, my students read um, a text. It's in our textbook. It's uh, by Anna Quindlen. It's, um, it is about doing nothing is something, and the argument is that students need free time, kids need free time, not even managed free time or scheduled free time, you know, piano lessons, basketball practice, uh, tutoring sessions, we need to stop managing it so much because that's not even really free time. They need time to actually relax, do things they enjoy leisurely, not on a strict um, regimented routine type uh, format. So mm -hmm. anyway, uh, students read it, and um, it's part of our argument unit, and I use that as kind of the intro activity. And what I had students do then was take the opposite position. So we analyze what components of argument she utilized in that argument, then the students were supposed to take that and take the opposite position. And so involved in that were, you know, obviously um, making an assertion or claim, backing that up with support, using facts and opinions, evidence, um, and it required a little bit of research, light research, to use some facts or statistics from online sources. But within that, they had to also, and I required the secondary component besides just analyzing argument was to imitate her style. Mm -hmm. And that was tricky. My students had a hard time with that. 
the first paragraph of her essay is somewhat anecdotal. It's just kind of setting the scene, and it's it's uh, to suggest you know free time's coming, students breaks are coming, and it's uh, so from a teacher's perspective, it has to do it's sort of like the mentality of uh, of like um, broken pencils, mm-hmm. uh, torn paper, ragged edged binders. <laughs> And that is her initial style, using fragments. Connie, uh, I'm glad she inputted this when we were asking her about breaking the rules of grammar. Uh, She said, actually, you know, writing in fragments is really good. It's a lot like what a copywriter does. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so I thought that's pretty interesting. Where were we thinking we were going to go with this episode? Well, um, we started out even calling it Writers Gone Rogue. We were going to talk about using... Um, grammar rules and, and breaking and then learning how to break those rules in order to find student voice. Um, but as we were talking to Connie, we really kind of shifted that focus to, I mean, that as well. I think that was It was also, inclusive. Right. Um, but also how to use grammar just in, to better our writing. Yeah. And I was really glad to have the turn that it took. And, you know, maybe sometime in the future we end up coming back to that idea of rogue writers. Mm-hmm. I think that's that's a cool concept. We might come across somebody, some other author who also could contribute input like Connie did to the subject. And uh, we can investigate that further. But I did like the turn that it took, especially what she had to say about powerful verbs and how, you know, when she gets students to write, as from the writer's perspective, to get things to be meaty and interesting and powerful she doesn't start with what she called static verbs in fact the matter is we're verbs that aren't very aren't very powerful Mm -hmm. and then she said you know dynamic verbs what do you think about that and have you done anything like that in your classroom or you know you want to or anything i think you were describing some activities you've done in the past on this um, well, as far as verbs go, I've, um, I've actually done something similar to what she described is getting the, the students to underline all their verbs and see what kind of verbs they have. Um, I did it with active and passive voice, though. Um, how many of these are in active voice and how many are in passive voice? And, of course, linking verbs come up there as well because, I mean, they're they're not action verbs at all, but they're definitely passive because you're not doing anything if you're just ising. <laughs> you're, yeah. just, you're just being um, or seeming or becoming. Um, you're not really doing anything. So I'm so um, interested in what you're saying. <laughs> so um, I have had them actually do that thing that she, um, that lesson that she recommended is getting them to really point out what kind of verbs they're using in their writing um, and then trying to change those to more dynamic action verbs, um, active voice verbs, um, rather than always being passive. Yeah, and there's so much practical um, strategy behind Mm -hmm. that, that uh, as far as something that I would like to do beyond uh, what my students are already doing is uh, trying to find unique and creative places to take my students uh, to go observe various people um, and events going on to get them, like she describes, to use more than one verb to describe a certain scene. Mm -hmm. And uh, just joking, yesterday, uh, Michelle and I were offering different places, and one, I I was like, wouldn't it be fun to go to TE, which is our transitional ed, or uh, like detention in some schools, and just have the students stand to the side and just watch those students, (laughs) uh, the things that they do or aren't doing, and uh, that could just be all kinds of fun. And, and, of course, the looks that those students would give. Oh, I bet. <laughs> um, also, uh, we talked about the lunchroom and just the the whole movement of going from the lunch line to the table. How can you – what verbs could you use to describe how people do that differently um, or the looks that they give people as they're approaching? Um, there's so many opportunities for that because um, our students have people everywhere doing the same thing, walking down the hall or going and sharpening a pencil or – you know, raising their hand. Um, so, so many opportunities to get them to observe and to come up with those different verbs, as Connie um, suggested. And kind of reminiscent of Dave Burgess's pirate sort of techniques, right? Mm-hmm. That's that's, I was actually just thinking of almost said it. That's really that's really uh, good. We could connect so many of our uh, guests that, who have been on our program to one another, and so, a lot of them know each other uh, as mm-hmm. well. So, there's kind of that thread of all of these groundbreakers and creative thinkers uh, amongst education and writing. 
Yeah, I was uh, even I just as li- I was listening to Connie and talking with her, I was thinking about Angela Stockman and make writing and how you play. Um, you know, Connie talked about playing with language and Angela talks about playing with language and just, you know, so many really intelligent people out there that are passing on these ideas. And so uh, I'm glad that we're able to pass it on to all of you. Now, wasn't there a point um, as far as playing? Could you could you think of any other parts of the interview where she suggests playing beyond what we've already discussed? I believe that Connie got into discussing like ways to act out or um, was oh yeah, would like the to be or not to be um, in the Hamlet speech, having them act that out when most of the verbs there are. Oh yeah, that's are, right. Are linking verbs. That's, what do you do there? That's kind of that's making or playing, except for it's in the sense of acting, mm-hmm. um, and you're kind of playing with the words in action. And I thought that's a really creative thing to do. Students students sometimes don't understand the uselessness of language. Oh man, I really don't want to like go hard on Shakespeare here because we love him. You know, <laughs> yeah. We can't, we can't be Shakespeare haters, but, but I thought that's a, that's a, uh, a pretty, um, thoughtful point to say, you know, to be or not to be, uh, is a great example of something that really doesn't give you much imagery in your mind as to what's being said. So that's a good example. And there may be uh, a few others that she mentioned that kind of overlap with the idea of playing, making, um, and that sort of thing as well. You know, and talking about uh, playing with language, one of my favorite things to do as an English student myself is um, diagram sentences. I love to diagram sentences. My husband has an app on his phone where he diagrams sentences for fun. I don't know that I've ever mentioned if my, that my husband's also an English teacher, but he diagrams sentences for fun, and I love diagramming sentences, and that's something that we've been able to bring into the classroom through our DGPs, our daily grammar practice. And Cade does this amazing thing with his students um, that they've really, really gotten into. So uh, take it away. All right. I won't say it's original with me. Some of my students one day said that they wanted to race, and that's how it started. They they wanted to kind of spice up the diagramming. And some credit goes to um, A-plus College Ready, which is an Alabama-based organization that works with the uh, uh, w- works with NIMSI, which mm-hmm. is the National Math and Science Institute. Yeah, Math and Science Institute initiative. 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 That's it. Yeah, and um, and so some credit also goes to to all of those folks because they're the ones who you know each week um, in their curriculum uh, suggest we use a sentence and break down you know parts of speech one day, the next day parts of the sentence, the next day we. Um, look at the fragments, or uh, not the fragments, the, the clauses, clauses of the sentence, and independent, and what type of what type of sentence it is, as far as a independent or de- uh, um, dependent clause, dependent or clause, complex and, sentence, yeah, right, exact, uh, and so on. So anyway, by Friday, after working through that same sentence, finally we're to diagramming it, and they should know it inside and out. And diagramming is uh, somewhat archaic in English classrooms nowadays. Shouldn't be because it is so much fun. It is, and and that's the key: fun, 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 fun. Because it's it's arch- it's perceived as archaic and outdated only because uh, a sufficient number of people have won over the argument that it's boring and kids don't care about it. Well, if kids don't care about it, it's because the teachers who once taught it at some point gave it up and didn't care about it. Mm-hmm. So if we see that there's a purpose, and and my particular purpose is students need to know the different functions of parts of a sentence so that they can interchange the parts of the sentence, you know, putting a subordinate clause at the beginning of a sentence rather than the end of a sentence and other types of inversions that can be made within the sentence structure. Uh, You can emphasize various parts of a sentence by uh, by shifting all of that around anyway. Mm -hmm. So um, diagram duels, go to hashtag diagram duels um, in Twitter or on Twitter and you'll see our hashtag. And certainly I invite any other English teachers out there to start Mm -hmm. doing it and contribute to our hashtag. Uh, but we have classroom microphones, and we, we make it fun. Commentators, one of the students, and he makes it as if it's like a boxing match. And uh, the students compete uh, both on time and correctness. Didn't anyway. you say they're, like, behind each other trying to really pump them up and help them out? And They, they do, and uh, sometimes we, t- we tag team it. Uh, sometimes one thing I want to do this, this nine weeks is actually make it, like, split the room in half and uh, uh, have them as two separate teams and make sure that uh, the, the competitors change every week 
and that they are representing a team which holds them more accountable to uh, doing their absolute best and being prepared for it. Yeah, I think it's great. Um, I used to, uh, um, I think I may have mentioned in the interview that in the first several years that I was an English teacher, I taught writing and grammar because they had a literature separated for some strange reason. And um, so I was able to spend a lot of time on sentence diagramming and we had diagramming races and um, even even way back in the archaic times um, we had <laughs> we had diagramming races but it was never to the level of your diagramming duels and I never came up with such a cool name for it. So yeah, I, I think whatever. That's super awesome. Um, but another thing that I have done before in my classroom and that I um, plan on doing again actually this year I don't I just haven't gotten around to it quite yet is playing around with punctuation. Um, I was uh, a few years ago we were reading a novel um, I think it may have been the adoration of Jenna Fox. I'm not real sure, but the author of that novel used dashes a lot. So as I'm reading through this book, I'm noticing, goodness gracious, at the dashes. And so I started thinking about how different authors have this punctuation personality. And so we took the novels that we had already read. I think there were like four for the year. Um, this was toward the end. And I uh, put them in groups, and each group had a novel, and they had to figure out that author's punctuation personality but in order to do that they had to know the rules so they had to know why that author would have chosen to use that punctuation mark um, incorrectly sometimes or use it where normally another punctuation mark would go um, and we noticed that we had some dash happy authors um, I am personally an ellipsis ha um, happy author um, whenever I write I tend to use those a lot we had some that used um, brackets or parentheses more often than others and so that idea of a punctuation personality really helped them to kind of figure out how to play with punctuation and I think that that's kind of you know the original idea that I had um, for this episode is, is just letting students realize it's okay to play with language as long as you know what you're doing and you're doing this on purpose and you're not just writing a run-on sentence because you don't know how to write a complete sentence um, you're writing a run-on sentence because you're trying to on purpose extend something out or make it seem like it's lasting a really long time. So you do that by writing this really, really long sentence. Or you write sentence fragments because you want the action to be faster. Whatever. Um, you want to make a point. So the the whole point of trying to bend those rules, um, to use Connie's terminology, is to help them to find that voice and to help them to learn to play with writing. Because writing's fun. And grammar can be fun. Maybe that's because I'm a grammar nerd. But I like it. And I think that it really can, can be fun. It doesn't have to be boring. It doesn't have to be archaic. Yeah, uh, and I was just thinking, um, you reminded me of a student recently who in my online discussion board, we use uh, Blackboard, in the discussion board recently, uh, I had asked about um, great writing, bad grammar, and punctuation was the, was the thread title. And um, one of my students, his name's Luke, actually introduced me to a book called Frearsome Engine, spelled F-R-E-E-R-S-U-M. And then mm -hmm. engine, E-N-D-J-I-N-N. -N -N. And he says, yes, I know it's a weird title, even weirder book. And he says he hasn't, ha hasn't read it all the way through. He had heard about it. But um, in his book, he says it starts – in that book, it says – he says it starts off as a normal educated person and suddenly switches to a terribly uneducated person who doesn't know how to write. He said he constantly uses bad grammar, spelling mistakes to get his point across, such as um, one half as have – uh, so like the one slash two as have, two, the, the numeric digit two as T-O, S-E-Z as S-A-Y-S says, um, D-U-Z as does. And so he gives these examples, and he says um, uh, it's, a, it's an extreme example of bad grammar seen throughout the text. And anyway, uh, I thought that's pretty cool. Um, he says, by the end, you know that the character actually explains several complex science properties and theories even and shows himself to be really smart despite the fact that he includes all these spelling errors and so anyway what you were describing as to uh, some of the intentional punctuation errors sort of overlaps with the idea of intentional sparing spelling errors and how that um, that sort of intentionality mm -hmm. uh, really brings out the character as you said the voice mm -hmm. of the writer and it creates another sort of dimension uh, or level of uh, depth to the purpose and 
uh, meaning of what the author is trying to convey. So that sounds a lot like Flowers for Algernon, how the how the author shows um, how he goes from his IQ being really really low to really really super high. Yes, it because does. of his grammar um, and how that goes from being uh, in spelling, how that goes from not you know being really bad to being super um, really. Look at me. I can't even talk. Um, having this really large vocabulary and saying everything cr- completely correctly. Yes. So as far as some things that I think we need to um, – that I want to begin to practice a little bit better, I, I do want to, in my classroom, improve uh, students' focus on uh, of using a variety of uh, words, a variety of vocabulary. And um, that takes some intentional focus for me. So I, I'm going to try to apply some of her – uh, suggestions to um, to build vocabulary before getting out of the source than adding. I think that was a pretty cool suggestion, and I, I'm going to try to work on that. One of the biggest problems in my classroom might be um, weakness in introducing text evidence. And so whether it's contextualizing evidence within uh, some kind of student-created sentence frame or just simply something like the author says or the author states, and that becoming redundant. Um, I think that there could be some application of even that style of writing, um, or rather the application of her verb uses, even in that style of writing, you know, that may seem more dry uh, to many readers, that we can really uh, enliven um, that style of writing through a strategic focus on verb use as well. And um, one of the things that I would really like to do is to work with my um, higher level students who get so used to trying to follow what the teacher wants and doing exactly what the teacher wants and how many sentences do I have, do I have to have in this paragraph and, um, you know, how long does this have to be and uh, that, that kind of thing, that whole idea of teacher pleasing and trying to get the A and getting past that and trying to find their voice and playing with that language and trying to use their imagination and their creativity because that is something that I feel is often lacking in, um, in the higher level students in those higher level classes because we are so geared toward academic writing and literary analysis and that kind of thing. And I feel like sometimes the creativity and the playing with the words gets a little left behind. And that's something I really want to focus on here in this last semester. You got to slow down. That's really the key to so much of this in our very busy world. You know, standards based instruction uh, compels us to stick to, you know, what could be a almost very mechanical sort of classroom environment where do you meet the standard? I'm teaching the standard. Uh, let's reteach the standard. And we lose track of some of the things that really come out when you slow down your classroom instructional pace. And you allow the students to uh, have fun. We've discussed that a lot in this. In this, uh, uh, what are we doing? This is called a an episode. A, oh yeah, podcast. Yeah, podcast. So this podcast. Um, so just slow down and um, think about what your students really need. And there's a standard somewhere that fits it. You know, especially when it comes to our language standards, but help those kids with words um and it doesn't have to be we're not saying you know get a list of vocabulary and define those words that's not that's not really what builds vocabulary as well as some of these strategies that we're talking about Mm -hmm. so um can we go into hashtag the struggle now because i've got one all right go for it okay so our hashtag the struggle segment um i think i actually tweeted out this question the other day because it's um something that has been bothering me how do you balance also bringing in those more creative assignments where they have to think outside the box and they have to maybe write for a different purpose other than this um, very clear-cut academic purpose that we've been preparing them for all this time how do you find I've got to prepare them for you basically 10th grade pre-AP and at the same time I would like to get them to start owning it a little bit more owning their language owning their writing a little bit more and so trying to find that balance has been a, a bit of a struggle for me this year. Well, that's a different kind of code switching, isn't it? It is. It's, a, it's, it's that kind of academic code switching, and there are different la- layers to academics. Uh, there's got to be a personal layer to academics. Now, here's something that we, that we you know, teach when it comes to reading. A, you know, here we just read Mask of the Red Death by Poe, 
and my students then followed it up with reading four different uh, scholar, scholarly uh, critical analysis essays. Very, very dense material on the subject of symbolism to the geography of the of the prince's castle to uh, a discussion of the the color the colors of the rooms and how uh, that's connected to various concepts of art that I myself have not studied lately and and may not have ever studied that, that was very deep and um so what I wanted those students to understand is you know where where did these writers come up with these ideas to write about to analyze the colors of the text red is actually the source of life and there's an oxymoron involved in the title because um, red represents life it also to this writer says it represents humanity and then of course the word death uh, represents, as he says, like something like the transhuman. Anyway, really deep, complex stuff. Students need to be able to identify those things. But if students don't have their own interests, if they don't have their own elements of, of personal creativity, they like art. Mm-hmm. If they don't dabble in art, they're not going to see the significance of the colors. If students aren't interested in crazy, far-out architecture, they're not going to really get to see the extravagance of Prospero's really oddly designed house. If they don't have personal interest in things that are uh, in the arts, for example, there's improvisatory, he says, and um, another word there is basically for the jester, for for clowns or uh, fools. And he has all these entertainers. If you don't have any interest in entertainment and follow some to some degree, you know, celebrities or uh, the desires of them, then you're not going to get it. And so, in my opinion, all that is just to say, how can you analyze a text if you don't have your own personal projects, loves, interests beyond the academic, you know? Mm-hmm. I read this, so I believe this. And, uh, and that's what all of these critical analysis essay writers do. They take something that has been a personal, creative investment, and then they transform that in their writing into some really academic, you know, focused analytical idea and I wanted my students so they have to have those in order to see things in text that otherwise wouldn't be seen just by a well this isn't that saying that because that's that's the problem is a lot of our students don't see the depth of text Mm -hmm. and the the figurative creative elements that the greatest authors put into what they wrote so so the struggle is to what extent I guess is it our job as um, as English teachers to, to try to bring some of that into the classroom, try to push students to really look for those things that they love and have passion about and th- to use their creativity and their imagination so that their academic analysis can be better because they've got something to build it on. Yeah. Yeah. So we got to practice that. They're finding All fun right, in so, their lives. So, so, Michelle, what you're trying to say is our modern – and Common Core does this to us, we, you know, and, mm-hmm. and we're not trying to just jab at Common Core because no, I, like Common Core I do, too. I do. Uh, it gives us a good basis. But what we what we do find ourselves doing is making English scientific. Yes. We, we make our classroom a set of hard, fast r- rules um, by which we can analyze something or we can construct something rather than giving them a blank slate where sometimes they create their own rules or they find what they what they deem necessary to find and so on. Right, so there's the struggle because yeah. there's a lot to figure out. Something we can talk about on another episode and y'all will just have to forgive our rambling. We've just been excited to be back. And no doubt. Here we are. I'm looking at the time right now and thinking that we're going to have some things to cut out here, Michelle. Mm, that's okay. You may have turned us off a few minutes ago. That's fine. That's fine. Uh, we just are, are enjoying that we're back and having the chance to, to talk to everybody. Our first episode back after a while. Yep. We hope that you will join us again really, really soon and uh, we look forward to lots more episodes throughout this new year. And may we all wave our grammar nerd flags Probably. Thanks so much for listening, and thanks to Connie Hill for sharing her grammar expertise. Don't forget to stop by acrossthehallpodcast.com for the show notes and join the Across the Hall conversation on Twitter at hashtag XTheHall. We hope you'll join us next time when we talk to John Spencer, author of Launch and Empower. See you next time.